Today's episode of Killer Shipwrecks is brought to you by Terry's Turpentine, offering natural solvents of unnatural quality. We're also brought to you by Choppy Streams, offering the latest technical solutions for those endless Zoom meetings. We got here. Episode four. So much good news this week. First of all, we got some really great emails in the past week. Yes. I noticed inbox was full. Yeah. A lot seemed to be related to your ill-timed investment in that Odyssey company. People (laughs) soliciting or offering you financial (laughs) advice, which is great. But I think that's a scam, right? Like trying to take advantage of you because they know you're prone to these, you know... Scams. And I thought I made it clear in the last episode that I no longer have any control of the uh, purse strings in this household. Correct. So... You did make that clearer. Now, in fact, a lot of the emails we got were regarding the, the little teaser I gave at the end of the episode. Yes. People were intrigued by the question. So I don't know if you remember, but the tease was this week's wreck is off the coast of the place where my mother-in-law went to boarding school. In the 40s, I believe you said. Late 40s. Now, a lot of the emails we got were assuming uh, that a boarding school, people were guessing, okay, so what are we talking? Either like England, maybe maybe New England, people were suggesting wrecks in the Atlantic Ocean, the North Atlantic Ocean. That's what I was going for. Fun fact, my mother-in-law is from Beirut, Lebanon, originally. And she attended boarding school in Cyprus. 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 What do you know about Cyprus? I know so little about Cyprus. I mean, I know that it's a republic, from what I remember. Very it, good. So, you know, that's that's. But then it kind of stops. Than I know. Stops at that. Like I don't know much more about it. I know it's got an island feel. It feels kind of Greek to me. But you know, lots of things feel Greek, so it feels. Boy, you're hitting it. You're you're hitting it out of the park already. And yes, it's an island, so that is also correct. And it is, um, part of it is controlled by Greece, and part of it is controlled by Turkey. Uh, And she went to boarding school in Nicosia, that's the capital of Cyprus. So that concludes our history lesson on Cyprus. To me, it sounds a little bit like, I don't know if you, were you a Hardy Boys reader growing up? Of course, I read all the Hardy Boys books. Yeah, I was obsessed. Yeah, I still have like two of my favorites, one with like there's snorkeling Hardy Boys on the cover. Um, I kept that that one. one. I kept that one for, and I still have it. But Cyprus just feels like some place that I would have first heard about in a Hardy Boys book. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like very adventurous. Yeah. yeah, And the department of antiquities and, you know, it just feels like, uh, and they'd be wearing that attire. Like it'd be like short sleeve shirts, but buttoned down. Now I read, uh, some of those books to my son, uh, when he was younger and a couple things popped out to me now reading it, uh, 40 years later. A lot of body shaming of their friend Chet Morton. Oh, remember? Interesting. They just, that's just like a running gag is uh, Husky Chet Morton. Yeah. Yeah. That happens early. So there's some body shaming. The other thing that I find myself worried about all these years later is I swear every single book, one of those Hardy Boys um, gets knocked unconscious. So I don't know if CTE is something that eventually materialized for those boys, but... Could be why they ended the series, I right? See. Like sort of protect him. Type of thing. They can't remember each other's names. Right. <laughs> Hardly the Hardy Boys. This would be the, the sequel. Um, but yeah, it, it got me questioning. How are you going to bring the Hardy Boys into a It got me though. questioning the parenting. You know, like how do they let them keep being detectives when they keep getting knocked right. out every single book? And when they're like kind of mean to chat, like, you know, sort of like, shouldn't they learn their lesson at some point? Like have their amateur badge taken away? I don't know. To me, that seems unfair. But let's get to the show. Let's do it. 
Is it tied to that year, the late 40s? Totally unrelated. Totally unrelated. But I will give you a different year. I'm going to give you a different year. 1965, okay? You're under you're underwater with a gentleman named Andreas Cariolu, okay? This guy's, this guy's um, he's about 100 feet down. He's scuba diving. He's mm-hmm. harvesting sea sponges. Wow. He noticed, he noticed before he went down, oh, it looks like maybe the weather is is uh, in flux. Maybe a storm's coming up. You know, he just kind of mm-hmm. files that in the back of his mind. He goes down, picking up sponges. Sure enough, the winds start to blow and his Uh-oh. boat, w- what he notices is the boat anchor is dragging quite a bit. So he says, I got to, you know, keep track of that. And it's it's a big cloudy trail and he's following that. And as he's doing that, he comes upon an outcropping, sort of, he doesn't know what it is at first. And as he gets closer, he sees dozens of ancient amphora. Do you know what amphora are? Well, flora sounds like plant related, but you put the am in front and I have no idea. Yeah, then you're screwed. You put the am in there and it's like a whole new ball game. Yeah, those, is it another genus or species? No, no, no. Amphora are those huge um, containers for wine in the old days. Like the big sort of wow, way off. <laughs> the big, it's got like the big bulbous base and then the thin top with the handle. You can, those are cool. Yeah. They're called what? Amphora? Amphora. Yeah, see, that doesn't seem aptly named, that that type of device you're describing. Okay, you know, that doesn't sound like an M4. That sounds like something light and airy. I'll get, <laughs> I think of those jugs as like, you know, that's like, whoa, you know, they're heavy. I'll get in touch with the Department of Antiquity. Maybe we can get the name changed. I'm not saying there's a petition in order. I don't want to have legal fees. So this guy, this guy, he he comes up on these things and, and you know, they're clearly quite old. Seagrass has grown over some of them and he's totally awestruck. And for a minute, he just wants to to stop on this thing and figure out, well, you know, what in the world is this? He realizes it's special. His heart starts racing, but okay. the anchor is dragging. Wait, what year is this again? 65. 1965. Wow. So this is not that long ago. Exactly. So Andreas is like, he's worried that his boat is going to ground itself. It's going to get, the wind is going to blow it into the coast. So He's like, he tries to remember, you know, he says, you know, I got to remember this spot, but now I need to go get my boat. Goes up to the surface, gets to his boat in time, and he can't wait to come back to the area. He's like, there's, I think I just found an ancient shipwreck down there. But it ends up driving him insane. He does 200 more dives over the next two years and cannot find it. Wait a second. Wait a second. Go back. He thought he encountered an ancient shipwreck. Yes. And that was because the anchor was dragging. Well, he's going, the anchor's dragging and it drags past something on the floor of the ocean. All these huge containers that look like ancient containers. Right. And so the anchor drags past that and he wants to stop and explore it. But then he's like, shit, no, I got, I got to go catch my boat. It's going to get, you know, right. Wow, and he couldn't mark where he was because he's just out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. It's a stormy day. He's all excited. He's worried about his boat. He's probably got a, he's got a bag of sponges that right. he's, you know, there's a lot going on for Andreas on that day. His friends, when he comes back and tells this tale, his friends increasingly are sort of like bullshit. You know, they, it becomes the the fish that got away story. Like, yeah, you found an ancient shipwreck. Where is it, Andreas? Everyone's got that story. Yeah. Finally, in 1967, on you know roughly his 200th dive, he fi- he finds it again. He is very excited, and this time he takes whatever measures to really you know locate the spot so that he can he, he will know for the future. He goes back to shore. He tells, you know, important people. He tells, you know, professors, stuff like that. And they say, well, this is perfect because we know. And he's very intent on, he said, I think this is like really, this is a big deal. You know, he's, I'm not an expert, but it just looks like, so I've never seen anything like this on the bottom of the, I guess this is, this is the Mediterranean. Yeah. 
Uh, but the Porsche, I, I think this is like the Aegean Sea, they call it, oh, like sort of the northeast of the Mediterranean. It's like the more exotic version of the Mediterranean. The so Aegean exotic. Sea. Yeah. In the Hardy Boys book, can't you see it? Don't oh, yeah. And it's it. warm, though. Like the water, you expect to be warm. And in the Hardy Boys, they call him a skin diver. Right. That's right. That, yes. That's what they be They always had those fins. They always had fins. Like they never snorkeled without fins. So this is the part of the story where Andreas, is, it, it's sort of the Jagger meets Keith Richards thing or Lennon meets um, McCartney thing. Wow. He gets hooked up with um, a, a doctoral student, a guy who's getting his dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania, Michael Katsev. No, that name does not ring a bell if that's what you're... There's no reason you would know who Michael no, Katsev is. not at all. I'm just telling I'm confirming. He was a guy, he grew up in LA, he studied at Stanford, he became interested in ancient sculpture, went to Columbia, I think, for grad school, while he's there, he realizes, you know, some of the best, I think it's like bronze, ancient sculpture. He's some of the best stuff seems to be coming from shipwrecks. Whoa. He pivots, he transfers over to UPenn to study with a guy who's into ancient shipwrecks. Wow. They have a program there in that? I don't know if it's a program or if it was one dude who um, like dialed in on that stuff. But anyway, that guy says, listen, I have gotten an inquiry from Cyprus. They have an interesting, they have a few shipwrecks there, but they have one that they're really excited about. And you'll get to, you'll be the first one. He says to the young uh, Michael Katzev, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll, it'll be a fresh find. Like nobody's done anything to it yet. Okay, so this guy Katsev goes over there. This is late 67, and he and Andreas go down there. And Katsev later says, yeah, when we swam up on it, it was um, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Oh, my God. He's like, this, is, this was like, this is the culmination of my dreams. Like, oh, my God. Wow. But he says there's a lot of work to do. He tells Andreas, he said, you know, what we're seeing here, the amphora, these containers, I think it's just basically the top of the shipwreck. I think most of what is going to be really interesting is under the sand. It's a kind of a muddy, uh, muddy sand, like really fine silt. Wow. He said, I, we have some surprises for us under there. So they start the process. They get a whole team of people, like 50 people who sign on for this project. And they're going to spend weeks, maybe even months, um, just bit by bit, taking this stuff up to the surface. Or at first, just cleaning it off and setting up a grid and just like noting exactly where everything is. And then bit by bit, start to bring it up. Okay. But how does the ownership work? Like, is it like, well, finders, keepers? This or is over there. I like what they do. This guy, Andreas, when he first found it, his immediate thing is like, this is treasure. It belongs in a museum and it in belongs. So the town on Northern Cyprus, that is, the nearest port is called Kyrenia and there's an ancient castle there. Ooh, so wow. they're already proud of their castle. And this guy is like, you know, this boat would be perfect in, in the castle in as part of the exhibit oh, wow. in the castle. And this guy Katsev from America is like, yeah, I, you know, I, I like what you're, um, what you're suggesting. So let's get down there. Let's really like dust it off, clean it off, really do a inch by inch diagram of this thing. Okay. Guess how many containers of wine, the wine, you know, was no longer in the jars, but they were able to do testing to show that that's what had been in the jars. Was wine. Yes. But were they able to test the age? Like how well, old is this ship? You're getting ahead of yourself. First of all, let me go into the cargo that they find down there. So they find 400 of those massive containers containers of wine. 400. Yeah. And describe the size of the container. One individual container. Don't describe all 400 in one lot. So they're big. They're like- Bowling ball? Is it? No, 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 no. These things are like sort of up to your waist. Wow. Okay. So like kind of like a mini barrel, like a keg yeah. or something. It's like a kegger. So you're talking about 400. 400 of those. They find 20 mill stones. These are the heavy, heavy stones. Again with the buoyancy. Uh, Dr. Shore, is there a theme throughout? <laughs> and, and I say a theme, I mean an inadvertent theme in which buoyancy is an issue in every one of these shipwrecks and in all of them, they seem to be carrying objects or metals that are obviously not seaworthy. 
I, I hear what you're saying and I, I take your point. Now, now I'm not um, a sea captain myself. You, you haven't even taken any courses, right? Online, some, some continuing education. Um, but apparently there's a concept called ballast. And so these millstones, which would eventually be used at mills to grind wheat and things like that, mm -hmm. were lined up all along the, and I'm going to throw another nautical term your way here, uh, all along the keel. Underneath the boat. Yes. From front to back. Okay. The length of the boat, you know, it's the, anyway, yes. so they got the millstones, those 20 millstones, which are inscribed, which say where they come from. You got the 400 things of wine. You got between nine and 10,000 uh, perfectly preserved almonds. What? That's incredible. In earthen jars. Whoa. Do you think someone actually was like out there and it's like, it's been a long day, super hungry. It's going to be a long ride back to shore. Do you have these almonds? <laughs> Speaking of being hungry. Yep. They also found all their um, the lead weights that More the crew weight. had used for fishing. No, no, little lead weights. Little little lead weights. Yeah, yeah like for fishing. Cannonballs, the mini ones. And they find four sets of like cutlery and plate. They can tell basically it's, it was a crew of four. You know, there's four plates, there's four forks, there's four like goblets. You know, there's four dudes, four people. With 400 cases of or kegs. Basically. Yeah, this is it's like a booze run here. A party boat. Party boat with the almonds. It's like, okay, it's five o'clock. Break out some almonds, crack a jug. Here we go. So four guys run this. I was surprised the size of this boat. It's 47 feet long. 47 feet. Okay. It's like a four-story building. And four guys run this thing. How old would you guess this boat was? I think this is a, a, a very good breaking point because you're about to reveal the year of the ship, but we do need to hear from our sponsors. What is the latest from Terry? I have such good news. I have been in a good mood all week. As you remember, Terry was concerned. He thought that uh, maybe his um, marriage was on the rocks, if you will. Susan was going to maybe file paperwork, something along those lines. So I, because you had that excellent episode last week where you were talking about Ohio and I, you know, Terry is based in Terry's Termitine, based in Ohio. So I was like, I just went straight to the boss. I called not Terry, but Susan. From the office line? Was this on your personal call on your mobile? Like, or did you use the, the office phone? The phone is, is um, still out on the mountain, but I drove down the mountain, okay. went into town, used the phone at Mary's and I got, I actually did not read reach Susan directly. I left a message for Susan and I got okay. a voicemail back from her that was very good news. She said, I'm just going to paraphrase. She said, you know, basically nobody's getting divorced. Terry overreacted. She said word for word. She said, literally all I said was, dude, you've either got to sell the forerunner or the boat. Which we knew. Which we <laughs> knew with too. The boat, he's a little bit of a knucklehead about the boat. There's no problem. You can keep running the ads. It's not a big deal. And Terry is going to continue to sponsor the show. She said, at least for the remainder of this season, season three. That's fantastic. We should let this season just run forever. All right, well, let's hear from Terry, and then we will find out about the age of the ship. Whether you're thinning varnish or paint, cleaning wood stains, making moth repellent at home, or just maintaining industrial equipment, Terry's Turpentine has you covered. Terry's Turpentine has been family-owned and operated since 1993. Terry's Turpentine, natural solvents of unnatural quality. All right, so now before we heard from Terry, you were about to reveal how old this 47, was that right? 47 feet? Yes, very good. 47 foot ship with all these jugs, 400 jugs of wine or, or mm -hmm. kegs, um, also had those millstones. Heavy, heavy millstones. It's got a lot of interesting gear. 9,000 almonds, well, perfectly preserved. The almonds in, yes, in those jars. We are going way back to the times of Alexander the Great. We're going 300 BC. Whoa, unbelievable. You've got to be kidding me. So they did the carbon dating on the almonds and found out that those were from around 300 BC. What? They did the carbon dating on the timbers of the ship, which when they when they did uh, excavate down and they did sort of clear it away and they really got to see the shape that the ship was in. See the shape that the ship was in. It's like a 
tongue twister or audio exercise. Right, go on. The uh, wood was described as the texture of wet bread. So that's like fish bait. So they had to be incredibly careful with it. And then they had to treat it with um, some sort of waxy compound that sort of solidified it so they could bring it up and put it in the museum and sort of reconstruct the ship. 75% of the ship was still intact, in place. Unbelievable. Wait a second. 75% intact from that long, 350 BC? Yes. 300. Okay, so the almonds were from around 300 BC. They tested, they did carbon dating on the timbers of the ship, and those were older. The, it appears that the ship had been in service for decades by the time it sank. And they were able to see, um, sort of reconstruct from uh, the timbers that several major repairs had been done over the life of the ship. What they were most fascinated by was a couple of the items that they did not find. Wait, items they did not find? Yes. And so one, so basically, this guy Katsev says, you know, this is a working um, trade boat. This is a, a boat that they're able to establish, look, the wine came from such and such island. I think the islands that it had hit on its way down towards Cyprus were like Rhodes, okay. R-H-O-D-E-S, Kos, or Kos, K-O-S. Mm -hmm. And then there's one other one I can't remember the name of right now. But basically, this boat had been making its way south through the Anatolian islands and picking up cargo at different places. Not a bad run, though. I mean, incidentally, like when you think of ships making runs, it's like you think of the Arctic and like, or, you know, like those crab boats, brutal and cold. And this this sounds like you got the almonds, the wine, you're cruising down the Antillian or whatever. That, that yeah, it's nice. like the opposite of like the Shackleton situation. You know what I mean? It's like... You're on a pleasure boat, so it sounds amazing, right? Well, but that's what takes me back to the items that were not there. Uh -oh. the, the This guy, Katsev, the um, guy from University of Pennsylvania, says, it's weird, first of all, that we don't find any coins. He said, in shipwrecks, these old shipwrecks, especially if they're boats like this that were involved in the trade of goods, there's always the captain's purse. There's captain's always purse. coins that have been used for transactions, you know, up and down the coast. Loose change, like for the toll. You got to have change. Loose change, change. Yeah. exactly. Change for the toll. Yep. He said, you know what else is missing? He said, I didn't find a single bone down there. Ooh, ooh. What is that about? Pirates? Bingo. Hello. Pirates. I'm picturing Johnny Depp in the, you know, with the patch eye. And I mean, I feel like they, in any era, they're not like a well-washed uh, group, group. They're kind of probably a little grimy and not known for hygiene. Um, dental work isn't probably up to date on these pirates. Totally. Now he said, likely what happened was the this crew of four was taken as slaves. Slaves were very valuable. The coins were taken. Talk about a bummer ending to that cruise. <laughs> the other, I know. It's like my my day. Even just when I thought my day couldn't get any any worse. Like, oh, you're taking the coins. Yeah, wait, and you're enslaving us? The other things that lead him be to believe that piracy was the issue here is he said, you know, there's no features in that. There's no, like, reefs. There's no rocky outcroppings. There's nothing that would have brought the boat down. Sure, it could have been a storm, but I need to do more research in this. You had plenty of time between our last episode and this one to do the necessary research. Well, no, this is like a side. This would have to be side research, like tangent. Oh, got it. Like, a, like our, this will be a bonus episode. This uh, jumped out at me. They said the presence of a curse tablet on the hull that had been like nailed to the hull also suggests pirate. Hello, that sounds like a calling card. <laughs> they described it as an uninscribed curse tablet. Oh, uh, wait a second. Wait, that sounds like some interpretation there. Uninscribed means like anyone can interpret that to mean anything, right? It doesn't have anything written on it. <laughs> so allegedly there was a thing back then where pirates would nail a thing to the hull, like a tablet that had some sort of brief prayer to the gods of the ocean to swallow up this ship and swallow up the men on it and essentially hide any evidence of the crime. Wow. And to hide the evidence. So it wasn't just like do the deed. It was like, and also let's make sure we don't leave a trace. You know, swallow up these men, you know, so that nobody ever finds out about this and we don't get in trouble for it. Now, I, 
there's just something about that. It's like when it, it reminds me a little bit of like when you're told the whole theory for how the dinosaurs died out. Sometimes I hear some of these theories and I'm like, I just don't really believe that yeah, that pirates were like nailing, like inscribed tablets with like an ancient curse. Just something I I want to really do my due diligence on the curse tablet, the quote unquote curse tablets. I think you're on to something. I don't know if that's called myth busting, but I totally get what you're saying. Like that sounds like mythical, like that we read that in like some treasure island book. And it's like, I love this guy's research. I love his work. I love everything about this. The curse tablet thing just it trips my um, bullshit detector, basically. Right, like that could be a plank that was nailed there to like block a leak. You know what exactly. I mean? And it's uninscribed. It's like, oh wait, now this is a prayer tablet. <laughs> it's like, no, it's plywood, dude. It's like we had a leak. Now, in his defense, one more bit of evidence for the piracy theory is when they get when they get under the hull, they find six iron like spear points, spear heads. What? So they do. So they do think that um, anyway. So that's the the working theory. Pirates took this ship down, in, enslaved the crew. So the people in Kyrenia, including um, the diver Andreas Karyalu, are really excited to have found this um, ship and to have met this guy Katsev, who does such a careful job bringing it up. They bring it up piece by piece. They reconstruct it in the museum and they do, they like test the hell out of it. They figure out exactly where the wine came from, exactly where the millstones came from. Do they have photos of this? Is this something Lizzie could post? Absolutely. She's going to hook our readers up. They figure out what kind of wood was used in the construction of this ship. It's called uh, Aleppo Pine is the kind of wood. Nice. So they do such a great job with the museum that the uh, folks in Cyprus are excited and they come to this guy, uh, Katsev, with a new idea. They say, you know, you diagrammed this so perfectly and minutely and intricately. We would like to rebuild a replica of this boat using the Aleppo pine no. and using the exact same tools that the the type of tools that they would have had available to them back then. So they build this thing and they get the best shipbuilders in Greece and they use the Aleppo pine again and they say these are the tools that you're allowed to use and one of the there's a little bit of an argument because the shipbuilders say well if we're going to build it this way we're really going to need some caulking, you know, to caulk the plate the seams and the, this guy Katsev says no. It's a deal breaker for me. He said, I found no evidence of caulking. So Yeah, there was no Home Depot back then. It's like, where are you gonna get caulked? So they build the so they build they build the thing and looks beautiful, but there are some seams where it's just not like a perfect, perfect fit. And the first time they put it in water, um Katsev's like trying to keep smiling, but he's like, Look, water's getting in there, it's you know, it's filling up a little bit. It's this is not gonna be uh. A working ship, but it turns out that the water gets in there, it causes the wood to swell just perfectly, and everything seals up just right, and it turns into a beautiful working uh, sailboat and it has a, a single rectangular sail and that's what they can tell from the rigging that that's what the original boat is a single rectangular sail and they said this boat that they built using those original methods went much faster than they would ever have estimated for a trade boat back they were like this thing moves along at a really nice clip but what i don't understand is so it seems like the nature of that wood is what enabled it to swell and, and then they're in like you know sort of cover up the cracks it seems like the guys that were in charge of building it having done all this research would have known that and not been such like poo pooers when they first put in the water like they should have anticipated that Right. I think these guys were so used to the caulk, you know, they were just so used to modern methods that they were just a little bit. And there was a lot of pressure because there was some sort of like upcoming jubilee or some sort of big celebration that was coming up. And so these guys were like, dude, they were like, come on, let's cut the corners on the caulk. You know, nobody's going to know. Right, but I'm just saying like 
you'd think if they had done painstaking research, is that one of the reasons they use this wood in particular is because the first time it gets wet, it swells, and then we're not going to have this uncomfortable period in which I'm being filmed, you know, complaining about the wall. I uh, never apprenticed in a shipbuilding uh, yard, either in America or overseas. Um, Confession, neither did I. That is a road that was not traveled. But I take your point. And it became something that the uh, Greek people were really proud of. I think the euro coin, I think it's like the 20 cent coin that commemorates um, Greece has like a picture of the Kyrenia boat. Uh, the Kyrenia too is is what the replica was. No way. And where's the museum? Does the museum have the actual artifacts from the shipwreck? The museum is in Kyrenia. Yeah. Absolutely. You can go see it right now. The actual items, the Greeks on their side and Katsev on his side, everybody was very happy with the way this worked out. Katsev also is no longer with us. But he really built a career on this thing. And this was considered like the way to do it correctly. And there's a fantastic movie that was made, a documentary that was made by the, whatever the public broadcasting system is in Cyprus. And it's called With, uh, what's it called? It's called With Captain Sailors 3, uh, made in the 70s. It's got that real kind of like, um, like moody, kind of sad 70s feel that documentaries always have in, in back then. And it just shows great footage of the um, wreck before. Before they brought it up and then great footage of them bringing up piece by piece and then even footage of once they start to work on the replica and there's also a good um, documentary on YouTube specific to the building of that replica where they they get into the whole uh, kerfuffle over the caulk. Wow. Incredible. I mean, that's incredible. And it's from 300 BC. 300 BC. And, you know, in a sense, it's a true crime right, situation. Right, because there obviously were pirates. There were pirates. And crazy yeah. to think that like when this ship was like cruising through and getting, you know, caught up with the pirates, Alexander the Great was around. Yeah. Like and he was tutored by Aristotle. Like that that really shows you how old this is. Alexander the Great was tutored by Aristotle. I did not know that. I did not confirm whether Aristotle told him to invade India. And you got to figure that it's before great inflation, right? So when you're getting tutored by Aristotle, it's not like just easy A's. It's a leg up. You know, it's clearly like a leg up, though, because you obviously have access to like, you know, the top guy. Yeah. And isn't he the one who weeps? Isn't um, good old Alex the one who weeps when there's nothing left to conquer? You know, he's when he realizes he's he's like conquered oh, everything. Oh, that sounds right. Or was that in that book, Alexander and the No Good, uh, Terrible Day? Or You know, you remember that kid's book? He cries too. I might be confusing the two of that. So now, Carl, you were mentioning our email. This is something that I think you and I had talked about uh, maybe a year ago, possibly doing, but we got an email from somebody suggesting a good wreck for you and I to um, dive on ourselves. Interesting. And they said there are some good shallow wrecks available. Like four or five feet? Because I don't, I'm not licensed to go exactly, much Exactly, yeah. exactly. But they described these as good beginner wrecks. Ooh. The only catch would appear to be that they're in Micronesia. Wow. Don't even know where that is. I don't even know where Macronesia is. Well, that seems bigger and easier to identify. Micronesia, I think, is in the same part of the world as Indonesia, but as you would expect, much smaller. Sounds like a lot of earthquakes. Krakatoa, no thank you. Apparently, some of these wrecks around Micronesia are like World War II era planes. So, you know, that would take us oh. a little bit outside of our mission statement because those would be aircraft wrecks instead of shipwrecks. We have to rename the show legally. Even just talking about it now, I'd rather go to um, the Mediterranean. That would be perfect. Now, as we begin to wrap today's episode, which was fantastic, I mean, really going back to ancient area of Greece and Crete, incredible. I do want to check into the curse tablet thing. That that doesn't sound totally according to Hoyle. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. Why are you why are you nailing that um, uninscribed curse tablet on my hull? It's going to cause a leak with that plank. Like that plank does nothing. It's not an adornment, please. <laughs> 
Careful, guys. We don't have any caulking on this ship, so I see you nailing something into the hull there. I'm concerned. Can I explain some physics of wood and what humidity and moisture can do to alleviate the need for caulk? One last thing I should have said. At the time that this boat was found, it was sort of the oldest one of its ilk, if I may use that word. Incredible use of ilk, which is different than elk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally different from elk. And um, since then, they have found a few that are older. One thing that uh, we still need to do is, do you know, can you tease next week's ship? I am deciding between two fantastic shipwrecks. So that's the teaser. It could be one or the other. And I'm not going to tell you, you know, until next week. Oh, man. In any case, fantastic episode. Yet again, I feel like I learned about a period of history in which I was not familiar with. So I have some internet sleuthing to do in terms of imagery with the Kyrenia, and I have some video to watch with respect to With Captain Sailor 3. Great job. Great story. Pirates, hardy boys, missing coins, enslavement. Incredible. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your great questions. And I would like to give you high marks for um, homing right in on the piracy early on. Pirates. Yes. I never would have thought of it. All right. Well, that'll do it for episode four. Can't wait for next week. I'm going to play our outro music. We'll see you next week. Sounds good. Brainstorm.